Thanks, uh, Jason. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, there was a wonderful sharing by Evelyn as well as uh, Elvin and Lynn. So uh, what I would share today is on our IMDA data protection certifications. Under IMDA, we have three data protection certifications that uh, companies can consider uh, to, to prepare yourself uh, in terms of compliance and not just compliance, but to strengthen your competitive advantage. Okay, so uh, just let me paint you a picture, background on why, why did IMDA decide to, to uh, come out with these ideas uh, of uh, certifications, okay? We believe, at IMDA, we believe that there are four data privacy trends uh, concerning the future of data. So first of all, consumers increasing demand for more privacy. Okay, let me give you some statistics. According to IBM's Institute for Business Value Study, more than 80% of consumers said that they have become increasingly concerned on how companies are using their personal information, their personal data. And 75% said that they have become less likely to trust companies with their personal information. So everybody's becoming more con uh, conscious and cautious in the way companies manage personal data. And given the, the recent number of high profile data breaches and increased focus on data privacy legislation, consumers are becoming more conscious on how their personal data has been, been treated by, by companies uh, and organizations. Number two, digitalization leading to data overload. Uh, I'm sure we are all familiar with, with terms like big data, artificial intelligence, internet of things. Uh, all these things are, are part of our transformation into a digital economy. Uh, and in this digital economy, uh, in the global digital economy, data is now viewed as the new fuel of this modern digital economy. And this is, uh, is definitely so, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the COVID-19 has, has uh, resulted in an increasingly digitalized uh, economy uh, with a surge in the collection and use of personal data. Okay, I mean, I can share with you all this, but uh, the best best uh, example to give would be myself. Uh, since the pandemic happened, I, okay, I just to give you a background. I'm the kind of guy that like to go to the hawker center for my lunch. Okay, I don't like to call in delivery and anything. Uh, but since the pandemic, I'm forced to work from home. Uh, I don't really go out uh, that often. Uh, I set up accounts with uh, Food Panda, Deliveroo, you know, a few of these players, uh, as well as uh, I have accounts with Lazada, and uh, FedEx, uh, they basically screw up my order, so I call them fed up now. Yeah, so we have all these things happening, and, and I, I know the last two months, three months, I've given my personal data to more than four, five companies. Four or five companies know where I stay. In fact, uh, from my purchase uh, behavior, they can sort of come out with some kind of profile. Isn't that kind of scary, actually? Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, as, as they innovate with, with my data, you know, I've given permission to, to use my data, yes, uh, consent has been sought and all that. Uh, but as, they, as, as companies uh, innovate with data, as they use uh, data to help them in their business, it is also very important to create the environment of trust. Now, the third one, increasing number of data bridges. Okay, according to a recent Dell EMC report, 34% of Singapore organizations were plagued by data loss incidents, costing an average of US 1.4 million over a period of 12 months. Uh, one more thing about this, this uh, statistics is a lot of companies do not know that actually that they have suffered a data loss incident uh, after some time later. So with this increase in data flow, especially in this increasingly digitalized uh, economy, data bridges are expected to increase. And for a lot of companies, it is not a matter of if, but when. Okay, and when it happens, it erodes public trust uh, in the ability of the business to keep their data safe. Okay, last but not least, data privacy as a business differentiator. Another statistic, according to a 2017 uh, Peniman Institute study, where they did a study on the impact of data breaches on reputation and share value, nearly two-thirds of consumers reported that data breach incident caused them to lose trust in the breach organization. And in fact, almost a third took active steps to terminate their relationship with the organization. Therefore, if a company invests in data protection, okay, they build consumer trust more easily than competitors who do not. Uh, in fact, uh, closer to home, in a recent uh, PDPC uh, study by the Nelson company, we found two in three cons uh, customers preferred to purchase 
uh, from companies with the data protection trust mark. That's a B2C. From a B2B perspective, four in five companies, okay, this is a B2B, four in five companies prefer to work with trust mark certified companies. So not only is it important that uh, you have to comply, you have to protect data, but it is also uh, something that sets you apart uh, in this increasingly crowded uh, economic landscape, increasingly digitalized economic landscape. So we have, as earlier shared, INDA, we have three data protection certifications. Okay, and the purpose is to strengthen Singapore as a trusted data hub that supports innovation and cross-border flow of data. So we have number one, the Data Protection Trust Mark, which is a domestic certification and it acts as the visible badge of recognition for accountable and responsible data protection practice. Okay, uh, I will go into a little bit more details later, uh, but just to share with you that this Data Protection Trust Mark or DPTM, it is based on Singapore's own PDPA. Uh, uh, but we took it one step further, we included international benchmarks and best practices and it was launched in January 2019. Now, the other two certifications that IMDA is administering, is, uh, they are the APEC cross-border privacy rules and the privacy recognition for processes, or in short, we call it the CDPR and PRP systems. Okay, they are multilateral privacy certifications to facilitate cross-border data transfer. Okay, so what they do is that, uh, I will go into a little bit more details later, but in a nutshell, the purpose for this two APEC certification is to bridge the different privacy laws across APEC region, to reduce barriers and to build consumer, business and regulator trust. And it is based on the APEC privacy framework. Uh, and in Singapore, we officially operationalized it uh, last year, July 2019. So let me just uh, take you in a little bit of a deep dive uh, into our data protection trust. What is it about? Okay. Uh, for the trust mark, our aim is very simple. We want to establish and recognize robust data governance standards to help business increase your competitive advantage and build trust with your clients. Four objectives, we want to use it to strengthen compliance, yes, but we want to encourage a culture, culture of accountability. Uh, that's the reason why uh, it is voluntary. Uh, you take the active step in going for this trust mark. Number two, it provides a competitive advantage for business. Number three, uh, through the trust mark, you will boost consumers' confidence in how the organization will manage personal data. And last but not least, we want the trust mark uh, to be used to enhance and promote consistency in data protection standards across sectors. Now, this data protection trust mark, it is a domestic certification, voluntary, uh, not mandatory, voluntary. It is enterprise-wide where we look at the uh, all your organization's data protection policies, your processes, your practices. Okay, and it is valid for three years. Okay. So as of today, we have a total of 32 certified companies. Uh, we have the big players. We have companies like DBS, the banks, the financial sectors, DBS, uh, AIG, Great Eastern was uh, just uh, certified about a week ago. Uh, we have as well the small medium enterprises. Okay, we have uh, M. Uh, sorry, we have Mamuru. We have uh, Manadoc. Uh, of course, M One is there. Uh, Telcos, uh, one of our first Telcos. M One Star Hub. Uh, we also have the charities. We have uh, the non-profit sectors. If you look at the last row, Tan Tok Seng Community Fund, uh, right at the end, second from from the right, Tan Tok Seng Community Fund, as well as a uh, New Hope Community Services. Because as long as you are private. Uh, entity in Singapore. You are subjected to the PDPA and it's important how you manage uh, personal data. And therefore, certification, especially the trust mark, would make a lot of sense for you as an organization. Now, people ask, okay, I mean, why would I want to put myself through the rigors of certification? What's up for me? I mean, what are the benefits? I think, right, I mean, there are five uh, uh, benefits which I can share and these five benefits uh, come straight from the mouth of our benef uh, companies who are certified who, who share with us the benefits of the Trustmark certification. Uh, first of all, it provides assurance. The third party certification always helps to validate your data protection policies and practices. Uh, going through the Trustmark certification, it will help you to increase your data governance and, and protection standards and help to uncover 
privacy risks. In fact, during the assessment itself, if there are gaps or areas for improvement identified, the assessors will point it out to your organization to allow you the chance to make remediation. Okay, so it is not the immediate failure, it is not the witch hunt where, oh no, we've got something wrong, we're going to fail you. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay, the aim is really to capability build organizations. Number two, it raises business competitiveness. I like to, to share this uh, very uh, good example. One of our certified company uh, with the trust mark, they are a local SME certified. They were invited to bid for a project by an MNC, okay, um, European MNC, uh, the only Singapore SME invited to bid for this project. And uh, surprise, surprise, they managed to secure the contract. Okay, so they were in a state of euphoria and, um, and of course, uh, shock, I mean, small SME securing this contract uh, from a European MNC. So they, they were curious, they approached MNC, you know, just to find out, hey, what's the reason why we were selected? And this European MNC, uh, the general counsel mentioned that oh, this project that we, that, uh, we are doing uh, involves a lot of sensitive, uh, high level sensitive uh, data, personal information. And uh, we noticed that um, you are one of the few organizations with a data protection certification. Uh, and especially it is a trust mark that's uh, recognized in Singapore. And that gives us a bit more assurance to select you as our vendor. So with the trust mark, companies, okay, not just one, one example, but we have companies using the trust mark, are increasing the business, business competitiveness. And at the same time, the trust mark helps to strengthen their customers' trust. Okay. Again, with the increasing scale of data breaches, data protection has become more important than ever. In fact, if a company were to suffer a data breach, okay, uh, the, there will be possibility of financial loss, yes. However, uh, what is worse is that reputation loss. Uh, financial fine, you know, you just, just pay an X amount of money, that's okay. Uh, but the reputation loss, that is something that is almost impossible uh, to restore back. And in fact, we hear stories of how companies, because of data breaches, have folded as a result. And therefore, the trust helps strengthen the customer's trust. It builds on the trust, the reputation that you have. Fourthly, it increases overseas market access. Uh, the data protection trust mark, it is administered by IMDA. So in a way, government of Singapore. And it comes with it, Singapore's reputation for rule of law, stringent quality control, and it gives consumers overseas, uh, in overseas market uh, assurance, okay, and help to differentiate your brand. And as well as helping you to open doors in overseas economies. Last but not least, it demonstrates accountability to regulators, not just in Singapore, but globally. Certifications are ways for organizations to demonstrate accountability to their regulators. Uh, closer to home, okay, PDPC. In PDPC's Guide to Active Enforcement, uh, it is written, it is written, okay, data protection certified companies may request or be given the option of undertaking from the PDPC in the event that they are investigated for a suspected data breach. Okay, so how this thing works is that the undertaking process is intended to allow organizations with good accountability practice, uh, i.e. having an effective remediation plan, uh, having an effective data breach management plan to be provided with a window of opportunity to implement these plans. And if the company in breach, okay, the certified company in breach, uh, manages to implement these plans successfully, okay, it would become a strong, a very, very strong mitigating factor to this company that's under investigation. Okay, next what I'll talk about is the APEC, CBPR, and PRP systems. Okay, uh, I, I, my, my uh, earlier presenters have talked about some of the aspects of the APEC uh, privacy framework and all that. Uh, but just to share with you, why, why is APEC so important? Okay, APEC, there's 21 economies. Okay, uh, accounting for an estimated 60% of the world's GDP with $20 trillion generated from world trade in a market okay, with 2.9 billion people. And therefore, it is exerting a larger influence than any other international forum or countries just by the sheer size of it. And in this day and age, the, the ability to transfer information across borders is a fundamental tool for business in the global economy. 
And as this flow increases, it is imperative that organizations demonstrate that they can be trusted in the way they transfer data across borders. So what is this APEC CBPR PRP? Okay. The APEC CBPR PRP, they were developed by APEC economists to bridge uh, different privacy laws. Again, we have 21 economies, uh, various uh, different ways of how each country, each economy may interpret uh, what privacy, what data protection will look like. So the CBPR PRP, is a it aims to bridge these different privacy laws to reduce barriers and to build consumer, business and regulated trust in cross-border flow of personal information. Okay. The CBPR, what is it about? It is a voluntary, again, it is voluntary, accountability-based system that facilitates trusted data flow between certified companies, okay? Certified companies among APEC economies and to demonstrate accountability and data protection, okay? The, the two differences between the CBPR and PRP is that the CBPR, it is designed for data controllers and both certifications are based on nine privacy uh, principles of the APEC privacy framework. Of course, for CBPR, it is based on all nine. PRP is based on two. Okay, there are currently nine participating economies in the CBPR system. So, for for CBPR, it is not uh, it's not automatic that uh, as long as you're an APEC economy, uh, you are participating. You will have to raise your hand and say yes, I want to be involved. Um, there are nine currently, and the numbers are growing. And uh, for PRP, it is a recognition system for data processes, okay? Or according to the PDPA, it is, we also use the term data intermediaries to demonstrate their ability in complying with relevant privacy obligations, okay? So the PRP is designed for data processes or data intermediaries uh, as known in the PDPA, okay? Uh, controllers remain responsible for activities of their processes similar to the PDPA, and it is based on two principles of the APEC privacy framework, which is the security safeguards and accountability. Uh, as of now, there are only two participating economies in the PRP, but again, uh, we will expect the numbers to grow. Okay, sorry, back to this. Just to uh, highlight one, two key differences between the CBPR PRP from the Trustmark. Okay, from the Trustmark, if you remember, I earlier mentioned that it is enterprise-wide. We look at the entire organization, how you manage personal data, your policies, your practices, for, for example, we look at policies concerning how you manage your customers' personal data, your employees' personal data, okay, everything, as long as it is related to personal data. For CBPR, it's slightly different. There is a specific assessment scope. Okay, you are able to drill down to the specific data that has been transferred uh, overseas, okay, cross-border. And we look at the, the, that, that specific data as well as the systems surrounding the data used for the transfer. Okay, and another key difference between the CBPR PRP and the Trustmark is that the Trustmark is valid for three years. Uh, CBPR PRP, currently it is valid for one year. Okay. Okay, just to give you a flavor of the structure of the APEC CBPR and PRP system, there are three players in this um, system. Okay, so first of all, we have applicant organization, also AR. AKA, you know, known as, as you guys, the organization, okay? That uh, you will be required, okay, if you're going to go for the APEC CBPR PRP, you'll be required to implement the data privacy policies consistent with the APEC privacy framework, uh, which is listed here. That's you, okay? Uh, the second player is what we call an accountability agent, okay? An independent, recognized public or private sector entity. Okay, so, for this, okay, for the AA, what we call AA, their role is to assess an applicant organization that they are compliant with the APEC CBPR and PRP system. Okay, so around the world, uh, we have a few uh, accountability agents uh, for the CBPR. So IMDA, we are, we are Singapore's AA, uh, JITTEC for Japan, KISA for Korea, and for the US, there are a couple of them, uh, NCC Group, Shaman and Company, as well as Trustee. Okay. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned that for PRP, there are only two participating economies as of now. Uh, and the AAs for the PRP system, again, IMDA. Uh, and for the US, NCC Group, Shaman and Company, and Trustee. Okay, now, the final player in this whole stage, this whole APEC CBPR PRP, would be the Privacy Enforcement Authority, okay? 
uh, usually I would ask, I mean, if this was a live, live uh, presentation, I would ask the, the participants, do you know who is the PEA in Singapore? Okay. Uh, no price for guessing. The PEA in Singapore currently is the PDPC. Okay. So what is their role? Their role is to enforce the privacy law. Okay. They enforce the CDPR and PRP pursuant to, their own, to our domestic privacy law, which is the PDPA. Basically saying that, hey, you know, applicant organization, please uh, uh, abide, comply with, with uh, the CDPR, PRP. Okay? If not, the PA will come into the picture, which all of us, we wouldn't want that to happen. Now, again, so, you know, you're watching this, you're thinking in your mind, again, what is the benefit uh, for the CDPR and PRP? What's the point of me having these two certifications? Okay, um, quite similar in terms of the benefits uh, with the trust mark. Just let me share four uh, principles. Again, four benefits that were highlighted by certified companies. Okay, uh, in Singapore, we, as we recently launched this, we have one, Crimson Logic uh, is CBPR certified. They are the first CBPR and trust mark certified company. Uh, but we do usually hold forums together with uh, other uh, certified companies such as Apple, uh, Cisco, for example. And they have shared what are some of the benefits? And we've, we've listed them into four points. So first of all, the CBPR PRP, it builds trust and confidence because with the CBPR, you demonstrate that you comply with the APEC privacy framework recognized in all 21 APEC economies. Okay. If you say go to another country, for example, you go to Japan and then say that, hey, look, uh, I'm PDPA compliant. They will be like, okay, uh, so you still have to comply with my local law. But however, if you tell them that, hey, I comply with, I, I, I'm certified with CDPR, which means that I comply with the APEC privacy framework, um, there will be some familiarity to them. They know what is this APEC privacy framework. Okay. With the CDPR, you also have demonstrated you have met the necessary requirements in cross-border data transfer. And most important, you are serious and fully accountable with the data in your custody. Okay. Take Crimson Logic, for example, they shared with us that the reason why they went for CBPR certification is they, they saw this as an opportunity to build trust with customers and business partners, and it allows them to demonstrate accountability through a third party certification. Okay, the second benefit, reduce cost and time. The certification acts as a testament to your standard of data protection. Uh, I'm not so sure about you guys. I'm pretty, familiar, I'm pretty sure that uh, you have experienced uh, requests from your clients, for example, uh, asking for evidence of good data protection standards in, in for example, your tender requirements. Uh, especially if you're doing Japan, uh, what I've heard is uh, Japanese uh, companies are starting to ask for data protection certifications uh, as a way to demonstrate that you have good standards. Uh, some of them especially pointed out that they, they require the CBPR, okay, especially if you're not a Japanese-based company. Okay, certifications are a good way to demonstrate your organization's adherence to robust data protection standards. Okay, I'm going to quote Mastercard's example. Mastercard shared that uh, there was an increasing number of clients uh, requesting for a certification uh, as a requirement in their tenders, their, their RFP, the request for proposal, and all that. Okay, the clients have been asking them, hey, you know. Uh, how can you demonstrate MasterCard has good standards? And they got so sick of it that of all these questions that they themselves, they went for CBPR certification, okay, which would then cut down in the number of time uh, taken for all these negotiations, for all these proofs and demonstrations uh, requested by their clients. Okay, same thing for Cisco. In fact, Cisco actually gave some statistics. They said that uh, previously when they negotiated with their clients, other companies, it took about 5.4 weeks uh, to, to show proof to the other party that they have good uh, uh, privacy practices. However, with the CBPR, they reduced 5.4 weeks to 3.8 weeks. Okay, so there was a uh, time saving, cost saving in terms of the need to demonstrate uh, good data protection standards. Okay, number three, it provides assurance similar to the trust mark. Okay, uh, third party certification based on the APEC recognized. Uh, benchmark would help to improve and validate your data protection standards. Uh, in fact, almost all the certified companies that we speak to, okay, MasterCard, Apple, Cisco, Crimson Logic, all the players, all agreed that it was important to have a third party to validate the data protection regime 
and therefore they went for this certification. Last but not least, it demonstrates good faith compliance to regulators and enforcement authorities locally and internationally that you have data protection standards that meet the standards of the APEC privacy framework. And this certification therefore would help you to open doors uh, in the APEC economies and gain trust with the authorities. Okay, I'm just going to talk a little bit about certification process. I've shared the benefits. Uh, some of you may have this interest, you know, uh, maybe I, I lit the fire in your hearts and say, that, yes, something that I want to go for, uh, you know, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, how do I go about doing it? Okay, so that's the next question. Let me share with you a bit on certification process. Uh, if you're interested, okay, first of all, I mentioned again, IMDA for Trustmark, we are the certification body. We are also the appointed accountability agent for the APEC CDPR and PRP. Okay. So number one, if you were to come, if you're interested, visit our website uh, here and uh, apply and make payment. Okay, I'll talk about the cost later on, so don't worry about the cost. So once you apply, number two, what happens is that uh, upon IMDA's approval, you will receive a self-assessment form. Complete the self-assessment form and select an assessment body from our panel of appointed assessment bodies right here. Uh, if you look at the bottom where my mouse is moving, this is our appointed panel of assessment body. We have five of them. So speak to one of the five, okay, or speak to all five, I mean, if you have the time, uh, to find out uh, who can give you the best price, for example, who, whom are you comfortable with. Once you have completed the self-assessment form and selected the assessment body, what happens next is step three assessment. Your assessment body with your assessment self-assessment form, they will do a documentation review. They will go through your policies, uh, your black and white, okay? Simply put it. Uh, again, you need to show proof that, for example, if you do this, where's the proof? Where are the policies? Uh, if you conduct training, where are training records, for example? Once that is done, uh, what happens next is 3.2 on-site assessment will take place. The assessment body will visit your organization, okay? Come to say hi to you, at your office, for example. Uh, don't worry, it's not a surprise audit. Uh, it is part of the process. They just want to clarify, for example, any, any um, perhaps they just want to clarify on your policies or just to chit chat with your staff. Okay, just to find out how, how the, the policies have been practiced on the ground. And I mentioned earlier on that um, if there were any gaps uncovered, the remediation process would then take place. Any areas of improvement, any, any gaps uncovered, they will share with you, they will share some best practices, industry best practices to allow you to remediate, to improve yourself, to level up. And once you have done the remediation, you've completed the assessment, the assessment bodies are satisfied that you have, you have met the requirements, they will submit an assessment report to IMDA. And if IMDA concurs with the report, you will be, the, uh, the, sorry, the organization will then be awarded the relevant data protection certification. Now, Cost, money, 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 okay? There are two fees involved. First of all, application fee of 535 payable to IMDA. Uh, to encourage multiple certifications, there is a single application fee. We have uh, allowed for a single application fee. A one-time fee of 535, you can go for multiple certifications. Um, and we even have further good news where we have waived it off for SMEs. So if an SME here, if you were to apply for the trust mark before 31st December 2020, uh, you will enjoy a waiver of application fee. And if you are interested in CVPR PRP, there is a waiver of application fee till 30th, 30th June 2021. Okay, so that is the first fee. The second fee, assessment fee. This is between you and your appointed assessment body. Okay, the price uh, would depend on the size of your organization. Okay, for example, what is your annual turnover, uh, the number of sites, uh, complexity of organization, the amount of personal data collected and held by our organization. So all this, there are, are many moving parts in this whole, whole uh, equation here. And therefore, to get a, a better sensing, a more accurate sensing of how much it would cost for your organization, my suggestion is go and talk to one of the assessment bodies, get an idea. They will be able to provide you a quote uh, based on the above uh, factors that I mentioned. Now, as Alvin has mentioned, uh, it's true. Uh, to be very frank, the Singapore government, they're quite generous in terms of grants and support uh, because they really, really want to help business. 
Uh, in fact, when I was dealing with one of my counterparts uh, from another country, they were saying that they are very jealous. Why? Because uh, they are hearing about all these fundings uh, that is administered by the Singapore government uh, uh, that, that we are really pro-business. And therefore, if you are looking for funding support uh, for the Trustmark or the CBPR, feel free to drop by Enterprise Singapore's website uh, to tap on the Enterprise Development Grant. Okay? So for eligible companies, uh, you can you will be uh, given this, uh, you can apply for this grant, which will cover the assessment fee, which I mentioned earlier on, as well as any third party consultancy fee. Okay, and uh, IMDA to encourage multiple certifications, uh, we have integrated our application assessment process. If you apply for both Trustmark as well as APEC certifications, uh, because they're similar, okay, a lot of uh, Trustmark requirements are also based on the APEC certification. So they are similar. So it will help to save cost, it will save time and effort if you were to go for a joint certification. Okay, uh, I've, come, I've come to the end of my presentation, uh, but do feel free to visit our website, uh, scan the QR code, visit our link here, to take a look at our three certifications. We have also published what we call a Trustmark success stories. So in this document, you will be able to hear from our certified companies, some of them, on the reasons they, they went for certification, what are the benefits. Uh, you, especially the, the story, the example I gave about this uh, local SME that secured the European MNC's uh, contract. Um, the story is inside here. Feel free to visit and, and take a look. Uh, and if you have any queries, feel free to drop us an email right here. Give us a call. Or feel free to, to just uh, let us know in, in the chat, you know, if uh, you have any questions or that I can address here today. Help me not. Thank you. Come to the end of my presentation. Hey, thank, thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, I, I think you have a couple of questions uh, you want to uh, ask our participants uh, right now. Um, how could you put that up? Um, and in the meantime, uh, if, if any of you have any questions, uh, please continue to uh, put them in the Q&A function or you can raise your hand. We'll give you a couple of minutes to decide if you have any questions you ask uh, while uh, the rest will uh, answer the question that you will see on your screen right now. Okay, we'll give everyone maybe about uh, 30 seconds more to uh, finish answering this couple of questions before we commence Q&A. Yeah, I think we are beginning to see um, some results take shape. Um, Dominic and uh, Evelyn, do you have any kind of uh, remarks you want to make or insights to share? Jason, are you referring to, I think I see some questions coming in in the chat. Hmm. Yeah. yeah so um, uh, do you want me to just uh, address some of these questions? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right. You don't see a poll yet. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just end the poll right now so that you can take a look at the results and uh, really have any remarks on that. Yeah.
Okay. So, so we see standard contract clauses are actually the, the most common common mechanism for data transfer among um, among right. those respondents. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's 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 uh, yeah. I think it's it's a uh, something that we see um when uh in in the EU we were told that uh, the standard contract clauses are mainly used for data transfer as well. <clears throat> but I do see that uh, there are some responses, positive responses to certifications. Yep. Um, yeah. And the others, I'm not sure if, if uh, anybody indicated, but I don't see anything here. Uh, what is the others? Okay, but I do see, you know, uh, at least, you know, 44% of the participants here or the respondents here um, interested to know about uh, specific data regulations. Um, okay. Okay, well, well thanks for the responses. Uh, and while we kind of know more with that in a bit. Uh, maybe we could we could start with uh, answering, I guess, the first question that had came in during the presentation earlier on, on whether there's any uh, public sources of uh, the volume of cross-border data flows and, and information on the stringency of, of data protection laws across different jurisdictions. Uh, I know there are a lot in, in existing on, on uh, trading goods, which is very traditional mm. uh, kind of cross border uh, cross border trade investment, but because data flow is kind of relatively new, I, I'm not sure if there is. Uh, um, does Evelyn and, and Dominic have any insights on this? Yeah, I don't have any sort of credible sources of public info on uh, cross border data flow. Uh, I think there's been some attempts to, you know, some uh, research reports try to have uh, uh, some gauge on some numbers here and there. But, uh, you know, in terms of the methodology, I'm not uh, very sure, you know, how are those numbers uh, computed. Um, as regards to stringency of data protection laws, um, I, I mean, there are a lot of uh, um, consultant reports out there uh, talking about the various uh, data protection laws. Uh, sometimes uh, it really is the, um, the difference uh, is in the uh, implementation of those laws, uh, how the countries uh, interpret those laws. I think fundamentally the principles are relatively similar. Um, so there are uh, times when countries, uh, companies can use um, very similar sort of um, uh, measures across the board. Uh, so making sure that you have a baseline uh, data protection uh, program in place uh, and then to take note of uh, certain sort of unique requirements in each of these uh, countries that you operate in um, because there are you know, some uh, unique requirements uh, either from a sector perspective uh, or from the data protection laws itself. Yeah, I would, I would add to that. Um, I, I have no idea what the numbers are, but I work for a lot of MNCs and there's a huge amount of data, data flows between their, their different entities, for example. Um, sometimes it might be restricted to personnel data um, because they've got centralised personnel management um, or at least because their top executives get... Um, assessed by HQ and HQ might be in Singapore, it might be in Europe, it might be in Japan. Um, and uh, some of them have um, outsourced processing to India or to the Philippines in particular. Um, I see a lot of companies uh, in Singapore that outsource, outsource some of their processing to companies in Malaysia. 
So while I can't quantify it, it's, it's something we deal with constantly. Um, and keep in mind that there's, you know, uh, SBF knows this, of course, but, you know, we've got um, a huge number of MNCs um, with their um, regional operation headquartered in uh, Singapore. And of course, we've got a lot of Singapore companies, homegrown companies that are multinationals as well. Um, so there's, there is a lot of data that goes back and forth. I, I see that uh, there are some uh, questions in the chat. I will try to uh, attempt to answer some of those that uh, I, I can uh, relate to. So in terms of penalties for the uh, data protection provision in the PDPA, uh, penalties are up to a million dollars. Uh, if you want to get a sense of, you know, what kind of violation, what kind of um, data breaches, uh, you know, have been, um, what, what kind of financial penalty has been melted out, uh, we actually uh, put it up all on our website. So we do put up our decisions. So PDPC have our decisions uh, on various uh, data breach cases. Um, as well as uh, the, the penalties in terms of financial penalties. But of course, financial penalties are not the only one. Uh, we do give directions for uh, companies uh, in terms of uh, ratifying some of their actions as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think, you know, if you want to know uh, more about that, uh, it, it's um, the, the website do have uh, a lot of such information. Uh, also on uh, the, the different sectors uh, that have, um, you know, sort of uh, some of these breaches have occurred. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the last, the last thing I want to do is encourage the PDPC to increase the, number, the amount of the fines, right? But <laughs> um, I think we heard a lot of things today um, from both Evelyn and Dominic of the consequences. It's not just the fines. It's the reputational risk, it's the trust, it's all of those things. Um, the other thing that I observe, because I often act for organisations that are being investigated, is just the, the time and management cost, um, the distraction that's caused by an investigation. So I think that, by and large, looking at the amount of the penalties is the wrong thing to be looking at. Um, it, you, you get a more realistic assessment by looking at do our customers care? Is this going to be a reputational issue? Um, is this going to be the best thing? If, if Is us getting into trouble going to be the best thing that ever happened for our competitors? Um, is, is the investigation, how, how disruptive is it going to be? Is it going to include all of our senior people? Is it going to derail or delay a new product launch? There's just so many other costs as well as the um, financial penalties. Just to make clear, Evelyn, I'm not saying you should make bigger penalties, though. <laughs> but yeah, there's a, there's a lot involved. It's really, really, really in disruptive for a lot of organisations, especially if they're not prepared. Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm maybe just to add on that, um, you know, we, we have recently put out a public consultation on the PDPA review. Uh, and there is a, um, one of the proposed changes to the PDPA is on uh, mandatory data breach notification. Um, so that is uh, an area that uh, when the Act is amended, uh, it will be um, uh, in where organizations are required to um, notify uh, the PDPC or even individuals uh, of any um, breaches. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your for your answers, uh, Finn and, and Lynn. Um, I'm aware that we are kind of um, kind of starting to overrun the time uh, quite a bit. Um, so I think um, we'll try to link up and, and provide um, any any kind of uh, contact information should our participants have any more questions. Um, but before we end, I uh, would like to uh, uh, have a quick feedback on today's webinar from our attendees, and also to remind everyone of this uh, industry consultation exercise Evelyn mentioned. Um, if you would like uh, for us to get in touch with you to participate, uh, please click yes uh, on the second question, uh, which you should be getting on your screen right now. And, and for those who do, um, it will 
likely be a smaller group event, uh, more interactive, uh, more back and forth conversation taking place compared to today. Uh, so that we dedicated to that. And uh, thank you very much for, for, for your patience. Uh, um, I'm aware we are slightly uh, over our time, but a big thank you again to, to our speakers with uh, putting a lot of work in sharing today's uh, information with all of us and we are heartened by the, the questions that uh, our audience is posing to us. Uh, we'll be sharing more information um, in the follow-up email uh, to you, so please keep an eye out for that. And uh, thank you very much to everyone again and have a nice day ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.